Pastor Ryan, how are you, brother? Good, man. We finally be able to do this, huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> awesome. How's everything? Good? Yeah, everything is awesome, man. That's everything awesome, is man. Awesome. God That's, is good. God is good. Man, you're such a blessing, man. I've oh. known you for about nine or ten years, bro. Yeah. And time flies, doesn't it? It does, man. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, uh, those of you who don't know who Pastor Ryan Conley is, Pastor Ryan Conley is the assistant pastor now of Calvary Chapel, Palm Desert. I know he started with the youth yeah. and, um, you know, the Lord found it fit for him to be an assistant pastor now um, to uh, Pastor Joe Coleman. You know, he does it for Jesus, but he, he he serves alongside Pastor Joe Coleman. And Pastor Joe's great, too, by the way. Amen. How, how, Amen. Yeah. The Lord the Lord uses him in a mighty way. And Amen. it's the Lord who makes, you know, raises people and puts down people. And yeah. the fact that, yeah. you know, we're going to get into your life. Um, I'm excited to see what the Lord has yeah. and what he's done to lift you up to a position of being an assistant pastor. So, um, so. The way I usually start these interviews is, and this is more for for my sake, for me to remember, because I have a bad memory, man. (laughs) For some reason, like when it comes down to like how I met people or people's names, I'm so bad with that. Um, So how did we first meet? Well, it was, uh, was, you know, looking back, it was like nine or nine or ten years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, I was fellowshipping here at Calvary Chapel Palm Desert working with kids. And uh, you showed up to a Saturday men's prayer with a couple brothers, and you kept coming Saturday mornings. Next thing I know, you started coming to fellowship here. Yeah. And uh, it was really cool because I remember uh, after you were here, I, I remember thinking, I've been praying, Lord, we need somebody to help with the youth. <laughs> give us, give, bring us somebody to help with the youth. Yeah. And so Jose comes in, and um, uh, Pastor Andrew was, was there at the time. Um, and then uh, we started fellowshipping. Then God led you working with the youth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, I remember we went to a conference, went to a youth conference. Oh, yeah, I remember that. At Calvary Chapel Bible College. Yes, and, uh, I remember that. <laughs> and you were like, the Lord has called me to come here. I don't know how. <laughs> I don't know how. I don't know when. And it was cool because you ended up going. And yeah, I did. Uh, I did. But, yeah, mm-hmm. that's crazy. But, yeah, it was like nine or ten years ago. Yeah, wow. So it was at the prayer know. meetings, huh? And you yeah. never know. That's that's a good encouragement. You never know who you're going to meet at the prayer meetings. That's right. Who, and the Lord might open up a door to meet someone. And yeah. here, here's your ministry, Amen. you know. Yeah, yeah. The youth was the youth um, ministry was fun. Sometimes I'd just get one one guy, <laughs> one guy, and me and him would come up here, and he would just you know open up and share stuff that he was going through, and yeah. you know I would minister to him, and I remember we would alternate, and it was yeah. it was cool. Yeah. It was very very cool, man. So yeah. that's uh, awesome, man. A lot, of, a lot of the teens they still remember you too. Oh, do they? Here, they hear what's, that? What's up with Jose? And they remember the teachings. They remember. You know, God's, God's word, it, it never comes back void. Oh, praise God. So, praise God that, yeah. you know, if it's if it's the word that they remember, that's yeah, the best thing. That's the best thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's the one thing we want to see them take away. Oh, yeah. Cause, forget everything else. Yeah, 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 yeah. Forget, <laughs> forget me. Yeah, forget me. <laughs> yeah, that's cool, man. I'm so, I'm so blessed to have, um, um, the way I see it, I guess, is that, the Lord only allows you to meet certain people in your life, you know, in this yeah. this little span of life that you have. Yeah. And the fact that he would allow me to meet you yeah. and even serve alongside you for whatever amount of time. Yeah. That's a blessing to me, man. Absolutely. So you're a blessing. Thank you yeah. for everything you've done for yeah. the kingdom, man. Yeah. You're you good. too, brother. You yeah. too. <laughs> I mean, you got an amazing story, too. Oh, you know. yeah. I mean, you're a blessing. Yes. Th- thank you, brother. Thank you. So let's kick this off, man. Yeah. Um, so tell me, tell me about your childhood. Tell me where you grew up. Where were you born? Yeah. Your relationship, perhaps with your, if you have brothers, sisters, parents. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Well, I, I was born 1977. That makes me 34 years old. No, for, 43. <laughs> for the uh, record. <laughs> I was born in 77 in Portland, Oregon. Yeah. Um, lived, lived most of my early life up until my mid-teens. Uh, I grew up in in the Northwest, right mm-hmm. around Oregon area. I lived in places like uh, Tigard and Aloha, surrounding cities that were surrounding the Portland area. And um, so I, I I went to school there. And uh, when when high school came, 
um, my life my life was pretty good as a kid. I had mom and dad were there. Um, I have two brothers and a sister. Mm -hmm. So growing up in that environment in the Northwest, it was it was pretty good. Um, you know, Jesus wasn't in our household. Mm. Um, that's for sure. Uh, I mean, we were uh, we were horrible practicing Catholics. You know, it was like <laughs> Christmas and Easter. Yeah, yeah. C and E Catholics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so, you know, Jesus wasn't in our home, and but yet I, I remember always having food on the table. I always had shelter, clothes on my back. Mm. I had both my mom and dad um, were there, so it, things weren't too bad starting off. Yeah. Um, How was your relationship with your parents? So my, my relationship with my parents was okay. It, was, it wasn't bad. Um, like, like I mentioned, you know, we can all find things in our life, in our childhood, you know, that, you know, mom and dad, you know, everybody's, everybody's fallible. Everybody makes mistakes. Absolutely. Absolutely. But all in all, uh, I had two parents that loved me. And, um, and, and, the, and I recognized that at an early age. Um, by the time I was 13, about I was 12, 13, my parents, uh, they split. Mm -hmm. they, uh, my father had issues with alcohol and my mom was tired of it. And there was just so much uh, animosity and anger in the home that they, they split for a, a, a few years. And I think that that's when I started declining too. Is when they when they split apart. Yeah. Um, you know, my mom she moved to Reno, and my father stayed in Oregon, and he just began drinking more and more and more. Mm. And so, um, my older, my two older brothers and older sister, they were already out of the house. Doing How much? What thing. was the difference? Age uh, difference. Age difference. Well, my youngest. My, the first one would be uh, my brother Tim, mm -hmm. um, and there's uh, what ten year gap there. Oh wow! And then my oldest brother Jeff, and he's uh, got me by twelve years or thirteen years. Oh wow! So there was a there was a pretty big age gap in between the siblings. Yeah. So they were had already kind of moved out and done, they're doing their own thing. Um, so it was me and Dad, and I just kind of watched my dad just kind of hit the bottom of the barrel, you know. And uh, so I started doing, you know, I started rebelling. I started uh, staying out late, sneaking out of the house at night, you mm -hmm. know, um, just kind of doing doing things to fulfill because it was now that there was a void yeah. of mom and dad being present. That mm -hmm. void was, uh, and that was a painful void to deal with as a kid. You know, I, I think it was 12 when they parted. Uh, and so it definitely was a start of, uh, uh, for me, of just going after other things to fulfill. Okay. And to fill the void that I felt in my heart. So here you are, you you had a pretty decent childhood right. in, in Oregon, correct? Right. And um, the, you, it comes to a point where your parents split up. Mm -hmm. Did they d divorce? They didn't or? divorce. They, they, they just they separated. Just separated. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, that's when... There, the age gap between you and your brothers was super, it, it was a lot. So it wasn't even like there was a big brother to kind of guide you or anything like right, that, correct? Right. So so here you are. And tell me, I guess, the, the precise detail in a sense where that started to decline. Like what was it that you remember that the enemy used in your life to start to make you decline? What right. type of influence? Well... You know, as I mentioned, I when when that void was there of family, all of a sudden it was just me and my dad, and he was toasted almost every night. So yeah, uh, there was this void. I started filling it with bad relationships and bad friendships. Okay. Um, and you know, it started off small, and it's just the sin that I let consume me grew. Well. After a couple of years of them being separated, my dad decides, well, we're going to move to Reno where your mom is. We're going to try to get back together. Okay. Um, but dad, my dad was still, you know, he was, he was a mess too. And uh, so we moved to Reno and that's where I started my uh, freshman year was living in Reno. Mm -hmm. um, and I had, uh, I had this bitterness uh, and anger over what happened that I just kind of let consume me. 
with your parents the yeah, bitterness towards yeah, your parents I was like okay. you, you you would think as a child you'd be like great mom and dad are getting back together everything's mm-hmm. going to be good but uh, there was a sense of um there was a sense of kind of an abandonment feeling that oh, i w- wow. and i was angry about it yeah and so uh, that never really healed and so what it did is it started to consume me and i started in reno as a 14 year old um i started with drugs started you know s- drinking smoking weed um, by the time I was 15, I was into meth, uh, very bad. Wow. So all um, this started around what, 15? Is that yeah, 14, 14, 14, 15. Do you remember the, f- the person who offered you these things for the first yeah, time? Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, I was looking for, I didn't want anything that looked good. Like in other words, when I went to the new school, I didn't find the people who had it together and try to come alongside and learn how to be a good student. Yeah. I was looking for the ones that were hanging out, you know, under the bleachers, the ones that are skipping school, the, all the troubled kids. Mm. That's who I wanted to be around. Okay. Because I just had that, you know, it's like that youth gone wild kind of a mentality. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. And I wanted to hang out with all, where the trouble was, that's where I wanted to be. Mm. Right? And I found almost like this weird solace hanging out with, you know, a, a, a bunch of just... <laughs> druggies and people who didn't really care about life but i found like comfort in that wow and um and so the the drugs just kind of came with that group of people Mm. um that you know let's try this you know you know smoke one of these and smoke a joint and Mm -hmm. then you know one day the kid shows up and he's got the stuff he's like the stuff's called crank you got to try it that's what they kind of called the meth back then yeah and snort it and um Start got hooked on that. I heard that once you your first hit of meth is like so potent yeah. and it affects your life so much that yeah. you always try to go back to that one yeah. hit and that and how how powerful it was and yeah you chase it but you never get back to it and that's what started and initiated like right. that downhill spiral huh yeah you remember anything that ha- that was significant that happened to you in that time period. Yeah, uh, there, well, there's a lot of things that happened in that, uh, let's say, from 15 to 17. Um, because I really got into the drugs heavy. And I was hanging around people that were doing really shady things. Mm-hmm. And this was in Reno. Mm-hmm. And um, so we, being on drugs and just trying to come up on money, we uh, decided to break into somebody's home. Um so I was almost 17, I was 16, almost 17. And um, so we broke into this home thinking nobody was there. Well, there were people there. Mm. And so we broke into this home and anyways, there was pers- two people there. And um, instead of just, oh, somebody's here, we, they, because we knocked on the door, make sure nobody was at the house. Cause there was no, not supposed to be anybody there. Instead of just, oh, somebody answered the door, uh, we kicked the door in with a group of friends and we kicked the door in and assaulted the people there and then you know robbed the house took what we could take mm. and um so here i am i'm 16 and a half maybe 16 and three quarters you know we break into this house next thing you know we're being chased down by the police we got like you know 20 cop cars chasing us down in a car Wow. And uh, we ended up just making this choice to pull over because there was really nowhere to run. It's Reno, so Reno has one road that's that goes around the whole valley. So yeah, heard, all you do is be doing is circles. Yeah, I heard <laughs> there's like nothing out there, right. you know, like it's, yeah. Wow, so you guys in a car? Is that in it? In a car, and, um, and I bring this story up because it was one of the, one of the parts of the, life, the life-changing things that happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we get pulled over next thing i know we got you know there's 10 car car uh, 10 police officers Mm -hmm. or more and they're all drawn on us get on the ground face down hands behind your head uh, behind your back and so i got arrested we all did Uh, the ones i were that i was with they were adults they went to county but because i was a juvenile i went to juvenile hall and in that i got sentenced uh, to um, a year at a place called NYTC, Nevada Youth Training Center. Mm-hmm. And that's in Elko, Nevada. And, and you know, the best way to describe it, it was kind of like a boy's, a boy's prison, kind of. Mm. You know, um, 
There wasn't any freedom there. You wore orange jumpsuits. You had locked down. It was a locked down facility. Hmm. Uh, chow time was together. Everything was marching in line. It was that kind of a structure. And I, so I was there for a year. How many juveniles were there? Uh, they they have anywhere from three to five hundred. Wow, that's yeah, big. Yeah. That's big. They, they, what they had, they called them dorms, and in each dorm was about fifty children. Okay. Or fifty youth, and so they had I think ten dorms. Okay. And so not all of them were filled, but so they could have had up to five hundred. That's 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 still a lot. That's a lot. It is a lot. But you know uh, when that happened to me. Um, it got me to start thinking not about, I, I still wasn't thinking about the Lord, mm -hmm. but it started getting me to think about maybe I need to make some life changes here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because one of the guys that we were with, he actually got five years. Uh, and here I am kind of getting a slap on the wrist really because I'm a juvenile. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I, I, while I'm there, I got my GED, you know, because I, I stopped when, going back a little bit. when I, When the drugs started, school stopped um i think my sophomore year i think i showed up to school like 14 days out of the whole year mm. i mean i had truancy officers at me all the time and you know always running it was just a mess okay so i didn't get my high school diploma so when i was at that facility i was able to get my ged there wow. and i started thinking about you know what i need to make some changes and so i was released from there just before my 18th birthday okay and then um so now I have this kind of mindset that things need to change in my life. At this point, the relationship with my parents, um, it, it was it was dead at this point. Did you live with them at this point? Or, I mean, or, I, or, or, did I, you get out of juvenile hall? I'm I, sorry. Did, I did. When I got out of the facility, okay. I stayed with them for like a few months. Okay. And then my oldest brother, who was back in uh, Oregon, he was actually in Washington, but he was right across the border. He was in Vancouver, Washington. Mm -hmm. I went there to stay with him and uh, got a job and was trying to trying to change my life, you know, And uh, but I, I had this relationship with my parents was kind of dead at the time because all that bitterness from before never healed. Mm. And so uh, I get out of there, out of the facility and I'm staying with my parents and then next thing I know I'm going to Washington and I'm trying to establish my life. I got a job working at a steakhouse there and how old are you at this point? Uh, at this point, I'd, I was 19. 19, okay. Almost 19 when I moved there. And I stayed there with my brother for a few years. I was in Vancouver. And I, I was excelling in the restaurant business. Nice. And in fact, I was working at this uh, steakhouse in Washington, and I ended up being the kitchen manager there. Wow. The restaurant manager. They wow. sent me to school, the community college there. Wow. And um, so I was doing really good, you know. Um, I wasn't really messing with the drugs. I was I was drinking a lot, mm. um, you know, but I wasn't uh, messing with the drugs. And while I'm working there, as soon as I turn 21, um, these two guys come into the restaurant that I'm working at the steakhouse. They say, hey, we want to talk to you about a, a, jo a, a job opportunity. So these two guys wanted to open up a bar and grill in downtown Portland. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, okay. And they offered me a good salary. Hmm. They said, we want you to build up from scratch a bar and grill. Um, and so I went to Portland. I went to work for these guys in downtown Portland. Now, downtown Portland is really shady in a lot of areas. What is it really? It is. I mean, you got, you <clears throat> got a, where we were at, there were strip clubs, uh, these cheap dollar bars were everywhere. Um, there was a lot of junkies around the area a lot of homeless, um, so it wasn't the best environment. So I went working there, and it, when I went to work for them, I was working so many hours that I was like, oh, I, I, I think I need something to help me get through the, these long hours, because I was literally opening up at the restaurant. I'd open up at 8 in the morning, get everything ready for lunch, because mm -hmm. we opened at like 11 o'clock or 10.30, and then I would work until three, 2 or 3 in the morning. So I'd get like two hours of sleep in between three hours of sleep. So I started messing with the, the, the dope again with the, the speed. Kind of keep you up a little bit. Keep me up, keep me going. Mm -hmm. And that just turned into this nonstop kind of a party lifestyle where I, you know, I'd open up the doors at the, the bar because in Portland you had to shut the bar down at 2 o'clock and 
we had live music there and everything and so I just opened up the doors to have people come in and start partying and they'd bring drugs and you know a lot of times didn't even sleep mm. and what this led to for me was a, a instantly almost a, a complete downfall and it br almost took me back to where I was when I was you know 15 16 years old consumed by drugs again with money with money yeah, yeah with money that's even more and, dangerous yeah so. and access to a lot more things and a lot more stuff so um, I still had the dead relationship with my parents when I was there and what happened in Portland was you know got into this relationship with this gal in Portland and she was into um, drugs as well cocaine and meth well she ended up overdosing on uh, what they call speedball she would inject it and she got OD'd she died and I remember getting really angry when she passed away I was 20 22 and she was like one of the girls you partied with or something you knew her yeah, like that yeah okay. I knew her she was, well she was like kind of like a girlfriend but off on yeah and um, she ended up overdosing and that tore me up at that moment in my life Everything was a mess because of drugs. And so what I did was I said, it's God's fault. I just came to this place where I started blaming God for mm -hmm. everything. So let's pause there. That's, mm -hmm. a good, that's a good segue for this is what, how, what was your, I guess, mentality or perspective towards God just quickly growing up? And did you, I know you said that you're Roman Catholic or pra uh, mm -hmm. uh, Christmas and Easter, yeah. but were you, did you have a concept of God to like pray to him every now and then like where were you at in this stage yeah my concept of God was God was angry okay and he was in the in the clouds just throwing lightning bolts at me mm. you know this angry God of judgment and wrath that you know all those times going to Catholic services I even went to Catholic school for a couple of years okay. never did I hear about grace or love or forgiveness um, or mercy it was always the judgment of God. It was always judgment, 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 purgatory, all the garbage that comes with that. And so I, I had this understanding that God already hated me. Mm. That's how I, that's how I felt at that time. Wow. Uh, that He already had this judgment and hatred towards me. So I, I snapped, literally, I snapped mentally uh, at that point when she passed away. I snapped mentally, and I, I didn't know how to deal with it. Mm. So I took it that anger and I took it out on God. Okay. So what that ha what happened then was I hopped in my car and I and I left that place in Portland. I left that job. I left everything. I got so fed up. I just packed up my stuff at the house I was living at and I I moved. I left everything there. I was fed up, and I ended up back in Reno of all places. Mm. And I don't know what led me back. Well, it was the Lord, but to go back to Reno, there was really nothing that good in Reno mm. that I, I could think of. So I went back to Reno and uh, I stayed. My parents were still in Reno. I stayed with them for a little bit there. And I tried to cope through life just kind of. I was working. I worked at a couple of different little bar and grills in, in there. I wasn't really partying much anymore. I started focusing um, in music. I was in a couple bands in Reno. Really? What kind of music? Um, well, it was like heavy metal. <laughs> Did you have the long hair and all that? No, no, they had the long hair. <laughs> no, I didn't have the long hair. It was, it was more like a, not. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you were in a band, is that yeah, it? Okay. Yeah. And so we, we started focusing on music. I was still messing around a little bit with the drugs, but not like where it not was. Not heavy. And I was working at different jobs, and um, so. I did that for a couple of years in Reno, uh, trying to establish some kind of sanity. Um, I, a couple of friends that I knew from the high school era, um, they were, you know, here we are, uh, you know, six years later, seven years later. Some of them matured a little bit, uh, some of them didn't. But uh, one thing we had in common was music, uh, and so we we had a band there and. Uh, we were trying to channel, or I was trying to channel a lot of my uh, anger through music, mm -hmm. and that's I think why I went down the the uh, it was, uh, it was like death metal music. It okay, was really hard. 
um, to channel that anger. Mm. Um, Cause I had a lot of anger built up. I mean, you know, a heart that's far from God is a, a heart that's desperately wicked. Mm. And it's, it's so true. Like the scripture says, our hearts are wicked, they're deceitful. And um, so I just channeled it all into music. And so uh, I'm there for at Reno for a couple years doing this with the guys. Um, but then I'm 25 and I up and I move with my girlfriend at the time to Grass Valley. Where's uh, that at? Grass Valley, California. It's Northern California. Okay. So you, it's right below uh, where Truckee would be Truckee, California. Okay, okay. Um, like 5,000 elevation. Wow. So it's up in the mountains, about an hour from Sacramento. Okay. Um, but it's way up in the mountains. And so I moved to Grass Valley and um, still trying to find my way. You know, I had this incredible anger towards God. I mean, it was incredible, man. Wow. And um, so I'm in, I'm in Grass Valley and... About 26, almost 27 years old. Um, I'm playing. I'm still playing music there with other musicians. Had a band in Grass Valley too. Um, but things started um, declining for me mentally. Um, so I can't. I don't know how to fully explain it. I'll do my best to explain what was happening. Uh, my mind was deteriorating. That's what it. That's what it felt like. Like uh, the drugs is that is that what you mean? Or? Well, yeah, I didn't know if it was. You know, I was smoking weed up there, and and then I stopped. I even stopped drinking for a little while. Mm -hmm. Like, what's going on? Yeah. Um, I started having these uh, feelings of paranoia, mm -hmm. um, where it caused me not to want to go out during the daytime. Mm -hmm. In fact, I liked going out at night. I like being kind of in the dark. Um, mentally, I was deteriorating, and I didn't know what was going on with me. Mm. And it was it was really scary. Um, I started losing a grasp of reality in a lot of cases. Um, imagine somebody who's taking acid. Um, how you lose that grasp of reality? Yeah. Well, yeah. that would come in and out on me. Those it would come in in waves, where it was almost almost like a hallucination. Um, and I didn't know what was going on. So I'm t about 27 years old at this time. Were you getting enough sleep during that time? Um, my sleep was uh, definitely sleeping. I mean, I was smoking so much weed. Yeah, you know, that makes you sleep, yeah. I slept most of the time. But, yeah. uh, no, I was sleeping. Mm. So I started getting worried. I even started laying off the smoking weed. Mm -hmm. like Because I, I was generally, I was genuinely scared what was going on. Mm. I didn't understand it. What was what was the hallucin uh, hallucinations like? What was there anything that you remember seeing or anything? It was just oppressive, like uh, you know, like oppressive and fearful to be out in the daytime, wow. almost like a paranoia. Wow. Um, I, I couldn't stand to even look look at the sun or look at the daylight. I, I couldn't stand it, you mm. know. And um, and I was really short with people. Like I started getting aggressive with people. Um, started fighting more and. Um, I was just, I was having these moments where I was just snapping mentally. Mm -hmm. And I knew something was going on. I wasn't sure what it was. So, excuse me. So uh, I'm 27 years old and I'm kind of freaking out. And I, I talk to my parents. I say, look, I got to get out of here. I, I call them up. And at this time, they're living here in Palm Desert, taking care of my grandma, my father's uh, mom so they're here in Palm Desert they said well there's a, a mental health facility here you know maybe you need to be checked you know check it out so I came here and I went to Riverside Mental Health and I started explaining what I was going on so I'm 27 years old explaining what's going on with me and it, at this time I'm not doing drugs I'm not drinking I'm doing absolutely nothing and everything is seriously intense as far as the kind of hallucinations, the paranoia. Um, it was really, really bad. And so I, I, something wasn't going, something wasn't go, something was going on that I didn't know what it was. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so I went to the Riverside Mental Health, and uh, they that's where I was uh, evaluated, and then um, they determined that I was uh, paranoid schizophrenic, mm. and I was also manic on top of that. What's manic? Uh, manic is just a heightened sense, whether you're manic depressive, so if you get depressed, if you're manic depressive and you get depressed, it's strong it's extreme okay it's, and it's uncontrolled okay so there's nothing to bridle that that um, that extreme breakout okay so when I would have uh, schizophrenic episodes um, they were manic episodes mm. which means that uh, I would really be freaking out yeah so I went there and they and that's what I was diagnosed as and and they put me on um, I was on like 12 different medications mm. uh, that they had me on. I was on f five anti different antidepressants. I was on five different uh, antipsychotics. And then I was on two that were designed for like a sleep aid. Uh, one was called a trazodone and it just, it deadens every nerve so you can re relax. The other sleep aid was um, Valium. Oh, wow. So I was on those 12 medications and I was staying in Rancho Mirage um, and, I, and for almost three years that's where I was living. What year was this? This would have been um, 13, uh, 16 years ago. 16 years ago. So, so what, uh, 2004? 2004. 2004, okay. Yeah. okay. So to 2004, 2005. Um, and I lived in Rancho Mirage, and that's when I first came to the valley. So it was like okay. 16 years ago. Mm. Um, and so I'm going to Riverside Mental Health. I'm on all these meds, and I'm just like living in this trailer in Re uh, Rancho Mirage, and I'm just miserable. Like I, I still the paranoia was stronger than ever, and um, I really. I was really frustrated, man. Yeah. You really believe frustrated. the medication was actually helping you, or what I do you think, think? I think the medication <coughs> was just making me even more of a zombie. Wow. You know, it was like... So now I'm freaking out, still having the same episodes, but I don't have the strength to do anything about it mm. <laughs> because of medication. Yeah. Because it just makes you kind of like a zombie. Yeah. Uh, and so I lived in Rancho Mirage, and then I, I had many episodes while I was in Rancho Mirage, and I got so frustrated after like a year of being in Rancho Mirage and struggling through this and battling it, I started again uh, playing with drugs here and there again with the medications that I was on because there were people in the trailer park that were dealing different drugs, and I started messing around with drugs again. Mm. And at this time, my mind was so fragile from the uh, schizophrenia and the manic depression that I was facing. Um, it was like, it was just such snap at random times. Um, I'm giving you the short version here because there's a lot of things that happen in between. Yeah, I mean, if you feel, um, if you want to share a story that, that you believe is significant. <coughs> what I really want to get across is when we come to where... I encountered a relationship with Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Because for me, that's when life actually mm. started. For sure. Um, my whole life leading up to that point was dead. Mm. And the fear, the paranoia, all that stuff, it was like I was mm -hmm. in a prison cell and I couldn't mm -hmm. get out. And so I remember getting back into the meth again while I was on the medications while I was in uh, Rancho Mirage and just getting completely strung out again on dope. And I remember getting so frustrated with it. Uh, but there was something that happened though. This is one of the turning points for me. So I had been up for four or five days. I was already mentally gone. Hmm. I mean, it was like a time bomb. And there was a show on TV at like two in the morning. It was a black and white movie. And I've told this story to some, and they're like, maybe that was just part of you hallucinating. I don't, but I don't think it was. It was like two or three in the morning, and there's this black and white show uh, on this movie. It's like Nazi Germany, and the Nazis are coming after this uh, Jewish family, and they have a farm, 
and this family who kind of runs into this barn to hide from the Nazis. And the Nazis see the family coming in and, and they, they torch the, the, uh, the, the barn. Mm-hmm. They light it on fire to mm-hmm. burn the family out. And you know how the, some of the older barns, they have those big doors that open up yeah. where they would bring hay through mm-hmm. up top? Well, those doors open and there's like this angelic kind of a person waiting for them. Like you're about to die, you're coming to heaven, mm-hmm. kind of a scenario that was yeah. happening. And I remember sitting there just kind of breaking down because at that moment I started thinking about God again. Mm-hmm. I started to, to st- and I just sat there kind of weeping and I couldn't stop it. And, I, and, I, and it got me thinking about the Lord and thinking mm-hmm. about, uh, I saw those arms, I saw those arms out, like, come in, welcome. Yes, you're going to die, but you're with me now. Yeah, yeah. So it got me to thinking at that point, and I was I, I was a complete mess, okay, and um, things weren't working out here, so I went back to Grass Valley again, thought I'd find some solace there, right? Uh, I was tired of these medications. I, I actually stopped taking like five of them, so I was only taking like six of the or seven of the medications, and I went to Grass Valley, I stopped taking... Uh, half my medications and I started uh, medicating with weed mm. and the other meds mm-hmm. um, no more dope again no more when I say dope when I say dope I mean uh, meth, meth. Yeah. so I know it's all dope but uh, specifically that's what I'm talking about and so I went back to Grass Valley and uh, th- this was the changing point for me did you before you turn because that's that's a pinnacle moment this, that's like the mo- most important moment right there but did I remember you telling me a while back that you had an, some type of encounter with um, Satanism. Yeah. Or, so oh, do you oh, want well, to through the whole the whole metal industry? Y- oh yeah, metal. yeah. So I don't know if you yeah. want to kind of share that because yeah, uh, with de- when, when you're in the when you're in the the band scene, it depends what kind of scene you're in. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're in death metal, it's it's twisted and it's satanic. Mm. I mean, and you glorify and you, you glory in that. Mm. The more pentagrams, the more referrals to worshiping the devil, the better. When it, when you're in death metal, Is that right? and that's where it gets its its term, that death metal. It's uh, it's 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 satanic in nature. Wow. Um, and so, um, yeah, there was a lot of Satanism involved in that when I was involved in those bands and doing that kind of music. Um, a lot of Wicca stuff involved, witchcraft and stuff mm. uh, was involved. Um, so yeah, that definitely uh, played a part in uh, the deterioration I was going through. Mm. Um, what shocked me was uh, my mind starting to go, and I, that was scary because that was kind of out of my control. Mm. And I didn't know what was going on. Wow. Um, and and I, I certainly know that there was a demonic oppression in my life. Yeah. Big time. Like, you uh, you you realize that oh, even absolutely. as an unbeliever that like I was telling you about watching that movie, right? There were nights where I'd lay in bed and I could almost hear demons just kind of swarming around my room, whispering. It was like uh, you know they they said that was part of the schizophrenia. Mm. Uh, you know when you hear voices, but these were demonic voices. These were so absolutely. I knew there was a demonic stronghold in my life yeah i definitely knew that for without sure. a doubt that's crazy i just didn't know how to get rid of it or did i really want to get rid of it mm. or what's the penalty for continuing like this i know how and you know satanic rituals and all that like they make some people make oaths and stuff and they have like oh i'm gonna give you know my whole soul to you or to a demon or something like that. And some people feel obligated to continually, um, you know, serve the the dark world in a sense. Mm -hmm. Did you ever go through anything like that that you remember? Um, As far as rituals go, um, when you play music, that's an act of uh, worship too. So sometimes the ritual was to be in a band and start a mosh pit. And then you got people in a circle bludgeoning one another, knocking them out people getting kicked in the head um just brutal brutal mosh pits Mm. and so that in itself you you almost get this uh sense of a demonic energy involved in that too yeah i bet that's crazy Uh, but as far as going to uh 
like satanic temples and stuff. I didn't, I didn't get. A, I was never that hardcore, and as far as that goes. Oh, okay, okay. But again, Satan's a deceiver, and he comes in. He can come in many different forms. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Um, okay, so we're back at yeah. at that. Uh, where you're Grass Valley. You, Grass Valley. Back okay. to Grass Valley. Uh, just trying to find solace from what's going on with me mentally. I was tired of the uh, psychiatrists. I was tired of the group therapies. I was tired of all the medications. I was tired of the the paranoia. And I was I was even worse when I was when I went back to Grass Valley. I was I was even worse as far as being almost like a vegetable. Mm. And this is the pivotal moment for me. Because when I watched, when I saw what happened with that video, it triggered something. I started thinking about the Lord. I started thinking about the Lord when I had, he was far from my thoughts. In fact, I was so angry when my girlfriend in Oregon passed away. I was just like, I don't want nothing to do with you. I'm so angry towards you. I don't want nothing to do with you. You know, I had that mentality. Um, and as I'm going nuts, I'm going insane. I go back to Grass Valley, and I, there, it came to a point where I was like, you know, I really felt I wanted to just end my life. I wanted to be done. Mm. Um, it got so bad that I was renting out this tiny little room. I mean, this room was small. Like, it had a bed, and it had a stand, and it had a tiny dresser, and that filled the room. Mm. It was a tiny, tiny little room, and I lived in that room for months. For months and months and I was like what am I doing here you know I'm just it's going insane and so there was one night that I was I was completely fed up I found myself just sobbing crying and I remember I that's the night I cried out to the Lord and my cry out to the Lord was something like this it was more like Lord I don't know if you're real or if you're not but I want to end my life and I need you if you're there I need you it was it was similar to that it wasn't this you know uh, it was my cry to the Lord the Bible says that if you believe in your heart and what that looks like for me it looks different for different people there's no uh, sinners prayer per se in the Bible it's a confessing with our heart right and believing on the Lord Jesus in some the most simplest fashion. Well, I cried out and I was like, Lord, if you're real, I need you because mm. I'm done. Mm. Now, up, up to this point, remember, I, I never went outside during the daytime. It had been four or five years since I just chilled outside and just looked at the sky or whatever. So I wake up the next morning and I can see like a little bit of light coming through because I had like two curtains covering the windows. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh great, it's another morning. I get up and I'm sitting there and I walk out, use the restroom, and I, and you walk out into the hallway, the door in the hallway had one of those big windows on it, mm -hmm. so the light was just beaming in. And I, I just remember that would always bother me if I got up during the daytime, I hated seeing that sunlight come through. And I walk in there and the, this big old beam of lights coming right through the door and I stood there and two things I reflect that hit me hard was one it wasn't bothering me to look at it mm. to look at the light it wasn't bothering me yeah the second thing that happened and this is why that movie was so pivotal for me the thought of that movie and the thought of the Lord just opening his arms saying come in that came to mind as I saw that beam of light. Wow. And I, I was like, whoa, what's going on here? And I'm, I go I go to the door, I open the door, I go outside, and I'm not, there's no paranoia. There's no schizophrenia taking place. None of that stuff was happening. Wow. No voices, no oppression. No, nothing. I'm just standing outside, and I, I see the grass out there. I see the sky is blue. I hear birds. I, you know, and it was like new. It was like it was something new to me, completely. Wow. And so, this is the cool. This is this is the part I like to talk about because the old Ryan, that dead Ryan, was miserable. There was no life in him, but this new life. I could be outside in the daylight now. I knew. I knew somehow God answered my cry and somehow 
he touched this sinful man. He touched this man who was consumed and who was demonically oppressed, who was paranoid, who was schizophrenic and afraid of everything, who was like reduced to this crust living in a bedroom. He took that man and all of a sudden I had life. And I'm standing outside and I'm so blown away by it. I'm so blown away by it that I'm like, the first thing I think of is my parents, right? Mm. Now, before I get to the next <laughs> section of what happens next, because this is, this is the hand of God. While all this is happening to me in Grass Valley, and while I was in Rancho Mirage, I, one of the things I forgot to mention is my parents recommitted their life. My dad recommitted and my mom got saved, and they were going to church during that time here in the valley. So they were both, because my dad got saved when he was a teenager, uh, or in his young, tw uh, early 20s. He got saved, but he walked away from the Lord when he came to Oregon and met my mom. Um, they were both on fire, born again, going to, going to church. And, and to fill in the blanks, I got to go back a little bit, because I would always blast them about the church stuff, right? Like it's a, that's a cult, I'd say. And, yeah. You know. Okay, so my parents had this prayer circle. They had a Bible study at their home, home fellowship. And they had this prayer circle of about seven or eight people. And these, this prayer circle, they were praying for me, right? They were praying specifically all the time just for me. Mm -hmm. And this is very crucial because th this prayer circle that had been praying for me um, I'm gonna, what, which I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, when my parents were walking with the Lord and I was going through my mess here, I'd come over and if there was a Bible study or something going on over there, I was like, I was gone. Mm. I wanted nothing to do with it. There was a time I had to stay with my parents for a little bit before I went back to Grass Valley. Yeah. And when they had their, f their home Bible study, I was gone. Mm. I'd, I'm not going to be anywhere near that stuff. Yeah. So they had this prayer group, this prayer circle praying for me. So the next day when I wake up in Grass Valley and I realize that God touched me, all of a sudden I started, things started coming to mind. The name of Jesus kept popping into my mind. It kept popping into my mind, Jesus, Jesus. And I had this kind of revelation that, that Jesus touched me, you know, it was like, yeah, he did. And it was so amazing to me that I packed, <laughs> again, I packed up a duffel bag. Yeah. Right? Left everything else that was there. I left it all. I got in my car, and I drive from Grass Valley to Palm Desert. Yeah. And I call my parents. I called them. Uh, where was it at? The uh, Out by the windmills, there's a re RV rest right out there. Yeah, yeah. I stopped there, and I, I called them from there to say, hey, I know this is weird and sudden, but I'm, I need to come by. I'm, I'm on my way. Can I, I'm going to stop by and see you guys real quick. They're like, okay, they don't know what to expect. <laughs> yeah. Like, what's going on? So I get to their house. Now, their Bible study was Friday nights. Mm -hmm. It happened to be Friday night. So I come up. I knock on the door. My parents answer, and they say, oh, oh, you're here. Okay, well, we're having our Bible study right now. Uh, we sh we'll probably be done in about an hour. Because they know, they know that you don't, you don't want. The I, I want nothing to do with it. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And I, and I was like, well, can I just? I can just sit in there. I'll be quiet. I can. They're like, what do you want to? <laughs> what do you want to do? What's going on here? You just you you know we don't hear from you. You're gone off the map. All of a sudden you show up at our door. Now you want to sit in the dining room while we're having our Bible study. Yeah. Yeah. And. So I go in with them. I'm sitting at the dining room table. They're in the living room at their house, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with the couch and the Bible study and all. And they're, they're finishing things up. And uh, my dad, I haven't got a chance to talk to him yet. And I'm just sitting there like, what do I, how am I going to say How am I supposed to say this? You know, I'm thinking. And so they get done with the Bible study and they're all having fellowship. Oh, it's Ryan, hey, it's, it's good to see you, you know. And. You know, keep in mind this is this is the group of people that have been praying for me. Yeah. 
which is going to speak on the power of prayer too. Absolutely. Um, and I talked to my dad. I said, Dad, Mom, I, I've come here to ask you for forgiveness for the things I've done to you. Mm-hmm. I said, but I found Jesus. Wow. And they about hit the, they about hit the floor. They almost fainted, I'm sure. Not only that, the prayer circle that had been praying for me, yeah. they were in the room right there when I came into the house and announced that I had found Jesus. Wow. That, and there they are. They've been praying <laughs> for me for the last two, three, or three and a half years. That's, that's amazing. And they're sitting in this room. And here I come from Grass Valley out of the blue mm-hmm. to just really ask for forgiveness and acknowledge that, you know, I have Jesus. That is amazing. And, and so I, I hadn't read the Bible at all, okay? I, I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't know the story of the prodigal son. I didn't know that story. Yeah. But here I am kind of almost kind of walking out that story, right, as a testimony to uh, God's faithfulness to, to welcome us back. Yes. So I went to church with them. I, I ended up staying with them. It was a completely different scenario i went to church with them there was an altar call at the church i was i stood right up do you yes. remember what church it was yeah it was uh it was desert springs right over here oh, okay and okay. um so i stood up for the altar call and uh acknowledged jesus publicly and my life has never been the same wow my life has never been the, so when i was 30 years old that's when life started for me I was 30 years old. That's when life started. Uh, I was born again. Um, it, it was December, uh, uh, December, uh, when I was 29, just before my 30th birthday in February. Um, and I was born again. Wow. There and, you are, man. And things started changing. I mean, um, <laughs> I mean, the radical change is, is so much, but first I want to speak on the, the deliverance from, uh, for those who are struggling with mental health mm-hmm. because it's a very real struggle mm-hmm. um, and I want to share this because it's it's very important to know that God did deliver me from those things he delivered me from the the schizophrenia the the the, the voices but some days are rough and I want us I wanted to speak on this real briefly yeah. because for those who are looking for deliverance in that in that section of their life if they're struggling with mental illness, um, it's okay to have off days. Um, you know, one of the scriptures that is, is so commonly misinterpreted, um, and, I, and I, it makes a big difference, uh, in, is in Joel, where it says, I will restore all that the locusts have eaten or the canker worm have eaten. Mm-hmm. I will restore it all. Some people say, well, that he's just gonna restore everything. But actually that word restore, it doesn't mean he's gonna give it all back to you. It means he's gonna give you peace with what is gone. Mm. That's a big pivotal difference there. Yeah. Because some of the things didn't come back fully. Mm. You know, sometimes I have off days, n- not with the voices or anything, mm-hmm. but some days, you know, can struggle with depression. Some days the depression is there. And you, you pray your way, you, pr- you pray your way through those things. Yeah. You give them to God and you let him be your strength and he gets you through those days. But there is such a peace and a freedom being in Christ. So for anybody who's struggling with uh, mental illness, um, I can't describe enough. You surrender to the Lord Jesus. Surrender to God. Um, yes, he'll do healing there. He'll bring about peace in your life though. The peace that pills can't can't give you. That's right. Um, it's a, it's a peace. It's a supernatural peace that he gives. Amen. And so I just want to encourage anybody that watches this that they're struggling with voices and 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 things of that nature. Yeah. Um, spend time with Jesus. Mm. You know, if you haven't given your life to Him, do it now. Say, That's Lord, right. here I am. I surrender to you, Jesus. I surrender to you. Um, and then spend time in the Word and prayer, um, because the the Bible says that by reading the Word, it renews our mind. Mm. It's a renewing of our mind that takes place. That's right. And, and if you're dealing with mental illness, that's where it's all taking place. Is up here. Yeah. It's all up in the mind. Mm. Um, and 
you know it's uh it's kind of like brainwash <laughs> yeah you know it, it cleans our it cleanses our mind it renews our mind for sure so um that's that's amazing man i just we just briefly want to kind of share or kind of talk about that because you've been struggling with that so long yeah. so long and like you said your health was going down like your yeah. mind was going down right. and for you to go out see the sunlight see how green the grass was the blue sky mm -hmm. and not feel that that's huge that's mm -hmm. like um if, like let's just say if there was someone walking by and they seen you they wouldn't think nothing of it mm -hmm. but for, for someone that has been going through something like that and suddenly it's gone yeah yeah um, like you said, there are people I'm sure that are going to watch this who are going through the same thing. Mm -hmm. And their only hope is Christ. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That he's our only hope. First Timothy 1.1. 1, 1. Yeah. Jesus is our hope, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And I, mental health is real. And is. The fact that you it shared is. that and God healed you in yeah. that. And it will, I mean, of course, things come back, but it, not to the same degree. Yeah, yeah. That's just the uh, the power of God right yeah. there. That's that's beautiful, bro. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. That's good. Well, you know, Paul had that thorn in the flesh he talks about, you know, mm -hmm. the Apostle Paul. And I, I think the thorn in our flesh is different for everybody. Mm -hmm. Whatever keeps us humble and keeps us close to the Lord. Amen. Um, for me, I have to start my day with Jesus. I have to start my day in prayer. I have to start before I even get out of bed. Uh, just taking a moment to ask him for help just to get out and take a step. Because the days that I, f I neglect that time with him and I neglect my need for him, those are hard days. Mm -hmm. And it can come in the form of like oppression and depression. And I just, I'm a pretty, you've known me for a while, dude. I'm pretty transparent. Um, I don't I don't put up a front mm -hmm. when it comes to being just real about struggles. and mm -hmm. um, Because... God to me is uh, very real and Jesus is very real Amen. and the power of God and salvation is very real absolutely and uh, so it's nothing I would never ever be ashamed of in my weakness that's where he's made strong so Amen. that's awesome you know, man. It, so anyway so now I'm saved you know 30 years old um, we're going to the church over here, and um, my father tells me one night, he says, hey, there's this group of guys going to this uh, Wednesday night Calvary Chapel, you know. So my dad and I started coming here Wednesday nights. Mm. Now, this is another pivotal point for me because uh, where I was at, I w I, it wasn't full Bible teaching. It was like sermonettes kind of. Yeah. Um, which, you know, for some maybe that works up. But what I needed was the Word of God to disciple and instruct me. So I came here on a Wednesday night. Pastor Joe was in First Kings. And here I am. He's like, okay, let's open our Bibles. You know how he does. Yeah. We've opened our Bibles. Now let's open our heart. And I'm like, boy, I'm still trying to find First Kings. Like, <laughs> is, that a, is that a New Testament thing? Yeah, that, that happens. First Kings? Yes, yes. So he, I go to First Kings. And then he teaches all, like a whole chapter. Yeah. Right? And about these kings that were wicked. Uh, and he was talking about king. It was all the stuff that pertained to my life and made such sense. Yeah. It was the first time I ever sat through a Bible teaching sermon. Wow. And we came, <laughs> Dad and I came Wednesday night. And see, I would have been, it would have been 2007, 2007, 2008. We come here on a Wednesday night and Dad and I are like, have you ever heard any teaching like that? He's like, no. I'm like, neither have I. It was awesome, dude. <laughs> We're like, dude, we got reading through the Bible e here. Expository teaching, right. chapter by chapter. Yes. It was mind-blowing, yeah. though. You mm -hmm. know, it's like I never was influenced by Calvary Chapel or Chuck Smith. I didn't even know who Chuck Smith was. Mm -hmm. yeah. I didn't know about the Bible, you know, teaching the Bible verse by verse. Yeah. Expository teaching. I didn't know any of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't even know an epistle from an apostle. I was like, yeah. Like, what's yeah. You know, all this stuff, I, I was... I was Bible illiterate, mm -hmm. right? I knew the author, but I didn't know his writings. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And so we came here, and we were hooked here. Wow. And then I wanted, you know, I, I too wanted to do Bible college. I was like, I want to learn more. I started coming Wednesdays and Sundays here. It was just such a blessing. Um, 
got to start making coffee and doing stuff like that. You remember f- when you first met Pastor Joe? You remember that? Yeah, I do. It was, well, it was that Wednesday night, that first Wednesday we came. Oh. How was that? It, it was awesome. And you know what was really cool was, so I, after that Wednesday, I knew that this was going to be my church home. Yeah. I was like, this is it. This is it. This is where God has brought me. So I showed up Sunday, and what was really cool, you know, uh, I came in Sunday, and I got here early. And here at the church on Sunday mornings, we kind of do a corporate prayer like 30 minutes before service starts mm-hmm. for, uh, for those who are there early, just lift up the service. And Pastor Joe sitting and he, he says, hey, you want to come and join us for prayer? I'm like, I'm like looking back, I'm like, are you talking to me or <laughs> you want me to come and join you for prayer? Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm like, uh, it was just, uh, there was this kind of, uh, em- I was embraced here. I was welcomed here. Yeah. And I felt the love here immediately. I felt That's awesome. I felt the moving of the spirit, not knowing what it was at the time, but it was the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. and the inclusion to be a part of the body here. Mm-hmm. And he invited me over to pray with him. And I, I felt so blessed. I was like on cloud nine that day. Mm. Like, I can't believe the pastor let me come in and pray with them. <laughs> like, seriously, you know? But it, is, it is. And it is a blessing. It is a blessing. But, but <laughs> yes, it is. It's so foreign to so many people. That's why I, I always encourage people when they get saved or they come to the Lord, get into a Bible teaching church. Absolutely. <laughs> get yeah. into a Bible teaching church because where the, the word of God is proclaimed, that's where the Spirit of the Lord is. That's right. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom and all the wonderful things that come with that. And yes. So I was pla- I got planted here. Mm-hmm. Um, I can mention I wanted to go to Bible college. God saw fit that I didn't have the funds to do it. And it just didn't work out at the time. Mm-hmm. So I got an invite to go into NCIC. Okay. New Creations in Christ. So okay. I was there late 2008. Can you explain just briefly what NCIC is? NCIC, New Creations in Christ. Uh, was a restoration ministry for men, mm-hmm. a discipleship ministry um, where men are restored, not just th- from drugs, uh, th- but they're they're reconciled back to Jesus there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a restoration program. Um, it's it's <laughs> it's boots on the ground discipleship. Yeah. Uh, now it's called NCIC two and Pastor Monty, yeah. who was a recipient of NCIC one. Yeah. Um, uh, now that's under under his leadership there, and um, but the original NCIC uh, is a place where men could come and sit at the feet of Jesus, yeah. and let God uh, restore them, uh, let God disciple them. It was like Bible studies every morning, Wednesday night, Sunday night, sir, or Sunday, Sunday morning, Wednesday night, uh, church services. We were at them. We were serving the community and. So I loved being there. I was there for almost two years, and I loved it. That's right. Um, I grew. I, I grew a lot there. Um, God, Were you in the program, or I was, was okay? Mm-hmm. Okay, wow. And uh, you know, I was in there. I wasn't. It wasn't a drug thing for me, or trying to get out of a, a charge or prison deterrent program. It wasn't anything. It was I wanted to be close to Jesus. Mm-hmm. I wanted to. I wanted to learn. I wanted to grow in my faith. What year was this? This was two thousand eight. Two thousand eight. Two thousand eight. Okay. So okay. Almost two thousand nine, and I was. I graduated out of there. I think it was two thousand ten, like January. Mm. I was blessed out of there. But I, we, NCIC was coming here to this church. Okay. So it was like a. It was you know I talked to Pastor Roman at the time. He was the one leading it. He at was that the time. one that was overseeing that ministry. And he would, they were coming here, and he's like, well, come check us out. And he invited me over, and I went into his office, and he said, you know, I was hanging out with the guys in the bunkhouse. Like, I'd show up on the weekends and just hang out with them, get to know them. Yeah. And really clicked, and he said, so he pulled, called me up to the office. He says, you've been hanging out, hanging around here a lot. He says, when are you going to surrender and dr- and come, come on in? <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean surrender? I already surrendered, you know. I kind of got a little prideful <laughs> attitude about it, like, but I ain't facing no charges. What am I surrendering to? You know, like yeah. I got like prideful about it. He's like, just leave everything, forsake everything out there, and come on in here, and let God work with you. And he challenged me in that. And I remember going back home, and I was like, kind of like irritated by the challenge. <laughs> like my pride set in. I was like, what do you think? What are you, I'm not facing a charge. You know, I, 
<laughs> I'm like, tell me, don't tell me to surrender, you know. He's, you yeah. know, my prideful heart. He says to go, yeah, no, come on in. I went home and prayed about it. The next morning, conviction, man. Yeah, God says, I want you in there. I want okay. You. you have nothing going right now. You can go in there. Yeah. And because I had no really responsibilities. I was staying with my parents, so I went in and let God work in me. Mm. And, um, and it was the one, most wonderful time of my life. Learned. Um, I bet you learned a lot in there. Learned Serve, a lot. Served. Serving. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, God taught me how to really surrender while I was there, too. Mm. Uh, you know, he, in that discipleship, I learned how to, to surrender everything to him. Mm-hmm. I learned how to cast all my cares on him. Yeah. You know? And what was really cool was, so here I am after I got saved. But you know what God did in there, too? I had this root still in me, this bitterness root from my childhood that I hadn't let go of yet. And God showed me through some dear brothers that were mentors there at NCIC. Um, and they were very special guys to me. And they know who they are. But they, they shared with me how to let God uh, kind of take things out at the root mm. in our lives and how we, how we come to Him and let Him do that. Mm. And uh, so I was able to get rid of that bitterness. And that brought such a joy in my relationship with my parents. Mm. You know, there was a restoration that happened after I got saved, but there was also still that little blockage there, that bitter root of unforgiveness, and I, it was still kind of in there. Mm. And God got rid of that, restored our relationship together. Yeah. So when people see my mom and dad and myself, they they look at us and they think, "Oh, you guys have been you probably grew up Christian." You know, look, you guys have it all. They say you guys got it all together. You look like you've been walking with the Lord for forever. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, no, you have no idea how dead we were to each other. Yeah. And God brought us back to life. He, wow. He restored that relationship, and he brought that together. And um, So I got out of NCIC, and I kept serving here. Um, and while I'm serving here at youth ministry, and you were here, Andrew was serving. Um, that's where I met my future wife. Who would be my wife? Yeah, uh, we started serving uh, in children's ministry together. Tara, she signed a children's ministry form. She felt this desire to serve, and she signed the form to be a part of the ministry. We started serving together, and you know it's kind of like that thing you're you know you're both digging the same trowel, you know the, the the same hole here. You're digging this thing. Next thing you know, you look over and you're like, wait, you're doing the same thing I'm doing, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, okay, something's going going on. We, <laughs> we had this friendship. Yeah. At first, you know, as brothers and sisters in the Lord. And then when we felt that leading to go into uh, a relationship, we came and saw Pastor Joe. We courted for like a year. Yeah. You know, and then uh, Tara and I got married back in 2013. 2013, wow. we got married. Um uh, and we we did the premarital counseling, and and we just did everything God's way, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and also for those who are single, <laughs> I'll speak <laughs> on this real quick. Yeah, those who are single, to just uh, keep your plow, keep your hand to the plow, keep focused on the Lord. Let Him be enough for you. Yes. And in His time, He'll bring the Adam or Eve to you. Yeah. Uh, depending where you're at. Yeah. Boy but. or girl. But you just stay focused on the Lord. If he has a relationship planned for you, he'll bring it together. Mm. He'll bring it together. We don't have to go searching on ChristianMingle.com or BigFish.com or any of that stuff. Mm. Uh, God will bring you a companion. Wow. But he's going to bring you one that's going to elevate your walk with the Lord. God won't bring you somebody who's going to draw you away from him. Yeah. He's going to bring you somebody that's going to en- enhance your relationship with him. And for me, that's Tara. She's the love of my life. Um, Yeah, you know what? Just kind of touching on that a little bit. You might not remember this, but I remember. um, Remember that time me and you went to the Bible college for a a conference, right? Yeah. Okay, so we... I remember, you know, we we go there, and obviously we have days there, and there's just classes and different, you know, teaching things Mm -hmm. that they do over there. And I remember one of the nights that me and you, we, we were about to go to bed, and um, 
and, and we started like just opening up to each other as far as like, oh, you know, what's God, what God's doing in your life and mm -hmm. what he's doing in my life. And I remember you had mentioned to me that you're like, man, I'm, I'm really praying. I really want a spouse. Mm -hmm. You told me that. Mm -hmm. and I'm just like, you know, I'm just waiting on the Lord. I'm just waiting on the Lord. And you, ha you, you kind of like were really like, I guess I was really on your mind at that time. Mm -hmm. And I think I don't know how much longer it was, a few months after that she yeah. came yeah you know yeah. and I, I remember when i seen you slowly starting to court her and talking to her mm -hmm. and all that i was like wow we were just having that conversation right. in marietta right. yeah, <laughs> and the lord brought brought her yeah and yeah. the fact that you were you know you guys did it god's way is so yeah. amazing man and that's the best way and you guys uh so you guys have kids now yeah. so we got we got married in 2013 and uh tara already had three children and um, we got married, so now we had three children, and then we had two more kids, so now we have five kids, and wow. uh, all five are they're they're my joy. Yeah, they're my family, my wife and kids, they're the world to me. And, wow. Um, I, and I'm so blessed because I couldn't do anything that I do now. I mean, <laughs> you guys, those watching, understand <laughs> that this is all grace. Please understand. God's grace in all this Amen. and what God's done in my life. Um, but my wife is one of the reasons I'm able to do what I'm able to do. Um, because, as you know, married husband with children, you're in it together. You're called in it together. Mm -hmm. And uh, whatever, whatever, whatever part of the ministry you're called into, you're called in it together. And um, she's just been such a rock of, of uh, hope and encouragement for me. Um, yeah, you know, yeah, sh and sh what what's cool is that they they all love the Lord, man. Yeah. Like they, th and that's a blessing. That's a blessing, like you're saying. Yeah. So it's just the grace of God because you know there's a lot of families that struggle with like, oh, there's two that don't know the Lord, or mm -hmm. there's two that really think this about Christ, but everyone else loves the Lord. Right. Right, right. now, it seems like man, everyone in your family loves Christ, man, I, I, which is a huge blessing. Yeah, our kids are all. Um, in a relationship with Jesus, they're all our oldest daughter Cassidy. She's on fire for the Lord right now. Mm -hmm. God's just really w stirring her heart. Um, and my son Tristan, he's just an awesome young man of God. Yeah. Tristan's just awesome. got a servant's heart as as big as the world. Mm -hmm. uh, faith is just amazing in her compassion and her joy. Um, and then Madison with her uh, spunkiness and quirkiness and uh, <laughs> she just uh, and then Joshua Absolutely. Um, they're just all amazing kids but we've uh, we've just been here at the church serving here um, together uh, we do everything together here uh, children's ministry Tara and I did it together um, even as a as assistant pastor uh, we're still a team here at the church it's we're a team. Tara, oftentimes she'll work with the children's ministries um, and helping out in that. Um, and we just, we're here to serve the flock. Mm -hmm. And that's ultimately what we're doing here is just serving God's people and serving the lost who yeah. come in and uh, just being readily available. And I'm so thankful for that, you know, because uh, God was stirring our hearts uh, for this new season, this, uh, this, uh, uh, being called into an assistant pastor role. How was that? Do you remember yeah. when Pastor Joe, I, you know, uh, came yeah, up to you? you know, God, God has a way of preparing your hearts for things. You Absolutely. Know? Yeah. And we went to this pastors and assistant pastors conference uh, in Golden Springs a few years ago, and w you know we went there and um, I was the youth pastor at the time, but I was doing a lot of assistant pastor duties. And uh, the, the assistant pastor for Raul, Dale, uh, Pastor Dale, he was sharing about what the, the role of an assistant pastor. And Tara and I are sitting there together, and Tara goes, oh, that's kind of what you do right now. <laughs> I, was, I, I was like, I, I think God's preparing our heart for something. And then, you know, Andrew, I talked to Andrew, and I'm like, like how do you feel about the youth ministry? Where, where do you feel God's leading you? And he wrote out his statement of faith kind of on what he feels God kind of a vision statement yeah and he says i he said i can't believe i'm saying this but i believe god wants me to be a pastor and so we started equipping him and training him up and then he came into the the uh 
uh, the youth pastor role yeah. as I right after I transitioned to assistant pastor. And, yeah. You know, and, and Andrew's been coming here for what, the last nine, ten years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, faithful and serving in the children's ministry, and he loves the kids. And he does. It's just, you know, God's growing us and moving us and shifting us and <laughs> you know and it don't stop it doesn't stop. it doesn't no. stop and it, it hasn't even ended this is just a little portion of what the lord's allowed you to live amen and amen. and here you are man I, I, yeah uh god god has been so gracious in dealing with me uh you know because the bible says that while we you know that while we were yet sinners christ jesus died for us mm. so that tells me that in our worst state in my worst state that I've shared with you, the worst anger I had towards God, even in spite of all that, at that most hateful moment I had, mm -hmm. Jesus died for me. And it squashes anything right there. I mean, it's a, no matter where I was at, he still died for me. Mm. And, at, you know, and that's, that's the promise that everybody who desires to know God has is that no matter where you're at in life right now, whether you're, you are saved or maybe you're watching this and you're not saved that that Jesus died for you you can't take it away you can't take it back you can't you know renick on that you can't say no I'm good I don't want it mm. no he already did it he already did the work and the cool thing about that is he's just waiting for you to acknowledge it he's just waiting for you to say okay yeah. Lord here yeah. I am I mean and that's ultimately what we want to see is people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus get saved yes because time is short man time is see short. what's happening around us and we know time is short time so. is short man yeah. that's in you know i was gonna ask you like you know what, what's your message to the world but that that right there just <laughs> that, that ending like you know jesus came and he died and yeah. he wants you to accept yeah. that offer before it's too late amen amen that's awesome man yeah well anyone you want to shout out really quick uh just uh just let everybody know hey i love you guys uh, those of you who know me, you know that already. <laughs> uh, for my family, watching out of Oregon and others, uh, give your life to Jesus. Uh, surrender to Jesus Christ, and you won't be you won't be disappointed. Uh, he loves you. Uh, he died on the cross for you, and uh, he wants to save you. So, Amen. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Appreciate everything. Yeah. God bless you. God bless you. Love you, man.